Hey everyone, this is Social Problems Lecture 5.1, Gender Diversity. In this lecture, we're going to talk about intersectional identities. We will talk about sexual orientation. We'll talk about the concept of gender identity uh, and how privilege uh, can impact LGBTQ plus people. Uh, in terms of content warnings, we are looking at uh, discrimination against uh, LGBTQ plus people uh, and anyone else in uh, the gay community. So, and this may not appear to be directly related to, um, to this topic, but the concept of intersectional identities is very important for understanding uh, modern feminist uh, scholarship. And as I mentioned in our previous lecture, this lecture has a whole lot to do with the previous lecture. So, um, I don't know. If you, if you want to review that, maybe this would be an okay time to do that too. Uh, but if you understood it already, you're good to go. So, intersectional, excuse me, I just yawned. Intersectional identities are components of our personal a personality that distinguishes ourselves from other people. An intersection then is a place where things meet. So to put this in another way, intersectional identities are those that are capable of interacting with our other identities to produce a more complex and more nuanced version of our personal perspective. How your intersectional identity combines with another intersectional identity of part of, is part of what makes you unique. And those overlaps, those are called the intersections or sometimes they're called intersectionalities. So I am a father, I am an educator, I am white, I grew up outside Pittsburgh, I am a cisgender male, I am a heterosexual, and if you haven't figured it out already, I am politically, vocally progressive. Those are my intersectional identities. Now we can compare these with other intersectional identities of other people. These are actually two of my neighbors that, um, that I live very close to, and I am friendly with both of these people. Uh, my neighbor one is a father. He works in a grocery store. He is also white. He also grew up outside Pittsburgh. He is cis male, he is heterosexual, and he is a subtle uh, conservative. My other neighbor uh, work, is a mother. She works at an abortion clinic. She is white. She grew up in Athens, Ohio. She is cisgender female. Uh, sexually, she is asexual, and she is a vocal progressive. So, we see a lot of stuff happening here, um, politically, philosophically, personality-wise. I have a whole lot more in common with neighbor number two. However, lived experience-wise, culturally, I have more in common with neighbor number one because we grew up in very similar places and we share uh, some uh, similar intersectional identities. Uh, these are just examples of how how people interact with each other, how all of these identities make us the people that we are, and can have an impact on how we interact with other human beings. Here is uh, this slide and the next slide are then visual representations of uh, those ideas. So we have the intersections, the identities of region of origin, politics, neighborhood, and gender uh, relating to myself and my two neighbors. And then here is a Venn diagram of what that looks like. The big gray circle is uh, the neighborhood itself. Oh, no, the big gray circle is, uh, I think, white. We're all white people. Uh, the uh, blue circle is gender, uh, in which I share, um, I am male, just like my uh, neighbor number one. Uh, we both came from the same region. We are all in the same neighborhood. I'm sorry, the gray circle is neighborhood, not gender. And then politics is the, um, the orange circle that I only share with one of those people. And uh, the first cluster is me and neighbor one. And the second cluster of politics is neighbor number two.
I hope that was helpful. If it wasn't helpful to you in a visual way, you're not really a visual learner, don't worry about it. Now let's talk some about sexual orientation. Sexual orientation is effectively who you want to have sex with. Uh, it is the way you want to have sex, uh, the, your general uh, feelings towards sex, etc. Uh, Alfred Kinsey in the 1940s and 50s identified this concept of the sexuality orientation continuum commonly known as the Kinsey scale. The Kinsey scale is very, it's a very modern concept. It was definitely way ahead of its time. What Kinsey was doing was he wanted to understand where uh, what he was then calling homosexuality fell into the scope of human behavior. Uh, at that time, it was considered that anything other be than being a heterosexual was a uh, psychological anomaly, and he wanted to understand that psychological anomaly. As the uh, research study continued, he found that actually there is a range of human sexuality. And again, the, the scale isn't perfect because it's limited by the concepts of the 1950s. But he found that human behavior ranges from a zero being exclusively heterosexual to six being exclusively homosexual. And in doing that, uh, modern scholars have observed that actually most people, regardless of whether they identify as heterosexual, homosexual, pansexual, etc., most people actually fall between the one to five category. There, many people may identify as being heterosexual, for example, but put in very specific sets of circumstances, such as many men when they are placed in prison for years and years, they may develop homosexual rela sexual relationships, right? That is uh, an example of uh, a, a prison inmate who identifies as being heterosexual, but has a uh, consensual same-sex relationship in prison would be someone who would uh, be a one on the Kinsey scale then. Additionally, modern scholars have observed that especially people that study uh, bisexual people and to a degree pansexual people, those people are not perfect threes, especially bisexuals are not perfect threes. It's not that bisexuals are, you know, equally attracted to any human being, right? The reality of the matter is most bisexual people are either twos or fours. They have a preference for one or the other, but they also are entirely attracted to the other type of person as well. Um, so there's a lot of very interesting elements that falls into the Kinsey scale. Another component to the Kinsey scale that is deeply intriguing is that modern scholars have observed that there is a very distinct possibility that sexual orientation has the capacity to shift over the life course. Um, this is illustrated by uh, what many of us have observed. Uh, maybe, you know, if you know enough people, you probably have heard the story of, well, there were these two people in a heterosexual relationship. They were married for years and years and years. They actually had kids. And then one of them left the uh, other partner for somebody of the same sex, right? Does that mean that the whole marriage was a sham? No, no, it doesn't. It could be, but it doesn't mean that. Does it mean that they were not very sexually attracted to that person? And at that time that they were exclusively heterosexual? No, that's not what it means. Kinsey's application and Kinsey's theory would uh, make the argument that actually what happened to those people is at some point their sexual orientation shifted and uh, maybe due to the nature of the emotional uh, component of the relationship with their spouse, they weren't able to work through that as a couple and that's actually what caused the end of the relationship. It wasn't that the person that wound up in a same-sex relationship was hiding themselves and ashamed of themselves their whole lives, it could be that they their sexuality shifted. And that is both a fascinating uh, concept and it's a little bit scary too, right? We like to think that 
we understand our human sexualities and that's never going to change. I, you know, I'm, uh, I'm just under 40. I like to think I have uh, my sexual preferences figured out, but according to this set of theory, may maybe it could change. Um, very, very, uh, sociologists uh, don't use the word weird. We use the word interesting. To define it just for the sake of giving you a definition, we would define sexual orientation as preference for sexual relationships with individuals of the opposite sex, the same sex, or both sexes. These are our examples of sexual orientation. This can include uh, heterosexual, being homosexual, uh, being bisexual, which many, most of us are familiar with the idea of being attracted to either sex. It can be pansexual, attracted to the personality of the person, not the sex of the person. That's what pansexuality is. Asexuality is not being driven by sex, but the person might seek romantic relationships. And asexual people, that is not to say that they can't enjoy sex, that they don't have sex with their, their partners, but they are not driven by sex the way uh, many of the rest of us are. Aromantic people then are a subtype of asexual people who are not interested in relationships. So if you are aromantic, you are also asexual. You, you're just you're just not interested in that whole thing. That's that's what those are. Now let's talk about gender identity. Gender identity is the per, our personal conception of ourselves as female, male, both, or neither. A transgender person, then, is an individual who has a gender identity that differs from that which is assumed or assigned to them when they were born. Thus, transgender people may be of any sexual orientation. It is about your relationship with how society perceives your body and how you think of your gender and your, uh, your, your personality as uh, someone with gender. Uh, it should be noted that uh, trans is now the generally accepted term uh, instead of transgender. Uh, that largely has to do with just the nature of the flexible nature of language. Uh, but right now, it's trans. It could be something else in 15 years, but right now it's trans. And we'll talk about a few other terms that are shifting a little bit later in this lecture. Other, There are multiple transgender categories, actually. A non-binary person is also transgender, but a non-binary person perceives their gender to fall into neither male nor female categories strictly. A gender fluid person then is a person whose gender identity either isn't set or can shift rapidly or dependent on the situation. Uh, I've heard, again, I'm not, I'm not gender fluid, uh, but I've heard accounts of gender fluid people, I've spoken to gender fluid people who have said things like, well, when I'm teaching, I am female, but when I am hiking, I am male. That is an expression of what it's like to be gender fluid. Um, Non-binary people then just feel that they are neither male nor female. Cisgender people then are individuals whose gender identity matches the sex that they are born with. So most people by statistics are cisgender. Uh, cisgender people may be of any sexual orientation. So, uh, and because cisgender are most people, that, that would also mean that most uh, gay people, most asexual people, most pansexual people, most of them are also cisgender. Some examples of gender identities include trans male, trans female, so those are transgender. That would be, a trans male would be somebody who was born into a body that appeared female, but in reality, uh, by nature of being transgender, they identify as being male, so they are a trans male. 
trans female, someone born uh, male bodied, but in reality they are female, thus they are trans female. Cis female, uh, so people who are born into a female body and feel that they are female, that's cis female, cis male, uh, same thing, uh, born male body, actually wind up being male. Non-binary people then is another gender identity. Uh, regardless of being trans male or trans female, and then also gender fluid there as well. These are all examples of gender identities. There are some obsolete terms uh, re regarding trans people. Transsexual is a term that means a person who feels the need to seek some form of gender reassignment. This term has actually become obsolete due to the obsession of non-trans people, of cisgender people, with the actual transition surgery. Um, this is a phenomenon that is fading in our society, uh, even within the gay rights movement, and as I was involved with it in the early 2000s, all of the conversations surrounding being trans during that era had to do with talking about the genital surgery, basically. It was people who weren't trans were just absolutely obsessed with that facet of being transgender and of, of that element of being transsexual. And because of that, there has been a distinct shift within the trans community to not talk about the surgery anymore, namely because it was objectifying trans people. Uh, Laverne Cox, uh, she has actually uh, done quite a bit of interviews uh, discussing uh, why it is not okay to talk about trans people that way, as if they are not necessarily uh, really what, as if they are objects, as if they are sexual objects, uh, and, and that uh, that whole that's a very big conversation in the trans community right now. Transvestites then are people who enjoy wearing the clothing of the opposite sex. Uh, this is actually a really old, incredibly outdated term. The better term for this is cross-dressing. Uh, that, that's the better term in general. Uh, usually, uh, these people are heterosexual men, which largely has to do with the phenomena of uh, hegemonic masculinity and toxic masculinity. Often, uh, cross-dressing heterosexual cisgender men are doing it to kind of escape the overwhelming um, expectations of them as being guys in that way. It may or may not be part of a performance. And if it is part of a performance, drag is actually the much better term for that situation, as in uh, shows like RuPaul's Drag Race. That show actually does a pretty good job of conveying at least that culture, if not actual drag performance. And uh, being a, a cross-dresser or what was once known as transvestite, it may or it may not be part of a sexual fetish. Um, that, that is left largely up to the individual. Another concept related to gender identity is the transition, specifically relating to trans people. This is when a person chooses to change their physical parts. It can include hormones, it can include surgery, it can include the social transition. We often think about the transition in terms of hormones and surgery, and for real, that is a very real part of it, but we underplay the social transition. Telling people, I know you have known me as Christine, but I would prefer to be called Chris. And my pronouns are they, them, my pronouns are not she, her. And that's a difficult element, right? It also um, may be the easiest part of the transition in some states is just filling out the paperwork. I don't know other states all that well, but if you go down to, uh, I believe it's the Department of Records, it may be the DMV, and just have your sex changed on the actual paperwork, that they can do that real easy and real quick, right? Uh, that, so that's relatively light. A uh, little heavier would be informing your parents about this, right? Uh, that I know you raised me as a girl, and I know you did your best, but actually I'm a boy, right? That is um, 
that's a comp that's a big component to the transition as well. And also, it should be pointed out that the medical components of the transition, the hormones, the surgery, etc., in the United States are intensely expensive, and in most healthcare uh, situations, they are not covered by insurance. Uh, there are a very small number of uh, American health insurance companies that actually cover uh, transition surgery. Uh, I believe ProMedica, uh, specifically in California, is, is one of them, um, but very few actually do. Uh, other terms uh, that are kind of phasing out about conversations about gender identity, but are still sometimes used with specifically within the trans community among people, MTF, uh, which is you're born male, but you transition to being female, and then FTM, born female, transitioning to be male. Those are also terms that are sometimes used, but really uh, the MTF uh, in modern parlance, would that we would just call that a trans female, and then FTM, we would call that person a uh, trans male. Now let's talk about privilege uh, and LGBTQ plus people because this is a, a point of nuance. So most problems among LGBTQ plus people do relate to heterosexism. Heterosexism being uh, defined as negative views about and discriminatory practices toward both LGBTQ plus individuals or those who are perceived to be LGBTQ plus and their sexual behavior. Um, so uh, real obvious examples of this are, you know, uh, you know, blatant slurs and insults against gay people. But also, if you were maybe a gender non-conforming teen, uh, or even if you are, are heterosexual and cisgender, uh, you also could be a victim of heterosexism as well. Uh, I specifically was bullied in high school because I was perceived to be gay. Uh, I, I like ladies, right? But I was perceived to be gay because that was, that was the perception of bullies in my high school, right? Uh, if you have been the victim of heterosexual, heterosexism, especially as a teen, I really strongly suggesting uh, checking out the It Gets Better project. Uh, you might already know about it, but I personally felt uh, that uh, working through some of the clips in the It Gets Better project. This has been about 10 years ago now, but it really did help me as an individual try to get over that that trauma, if you will. And if you know any teens too, it's also very useful. Now, heterosexual privilege then, to tie in with our conversations about privilege, are the advantages that heterosexuals or people perceived to be heterosexuals may enjoy because of their orientation as not LGBTQ+. This is the most obvious type of privilege when studying gender diversity. And if you're uh, interested in this, you want a meet more detailed list of this, I would suggest uh, carefully examining uh, the list of heterosexual privileges on page 159 of our text. And then finally, uh, when we talk about the LGBTQ plus community, we have to talk about male privilege within that community because it is very real in that community. Even if people are not hegemonically masculine, there still is an advantage of being a male and especially a white male in the LGBT community. The reality is that within the community, gay white men hold a disproportionate number of positions of power. Sorry, that cut off there. And while gay men are absolutely underprivileged in the United States, this phenomena within the community highlights the need for nuance in studying all social phenomena. Let me get to exactly what I'm talking about here. I was once at a uh, political meeting uh, among, I was, I was observing as a political observer. I wasn't, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm cisgender, I'm heterosexual, so I wasn't voting or anything um, because I wasn't part of the group, I was just observing. And there was one specific division within the group that was particularly powerful, that was a little bit more, 
you could almost say conservative, but not quite. But you could tell that they ran the power of the organization. And they were almost exclusively uh, white men. Even though they were not heterosexual, they still had that degree of male privilege. And so certainly uh, privilege can even be exerted within uh, discriminated against groups as well, is really what I want to drive home there. All of these topics, all of them, all of them, we talk about sexuality, we talk about sex, we talk about race, we talk about poverty, whatever. All of it requires nuance. To properly understand our social world, you need to understand the very infinite particulars of our social world. And that's what sociology is. So I hope you found uh, this lecture interesting and uh, got any questions, just send me an email. Talk to you later.